Okay, very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to the sessions on technology uh, competition or cooperations. My name is Lee Dong-min from Tango University based here in South Korea. Uh, as all of you here may agree and I'm fully aware of, uh, one of the contending issues on trade war between the United States and China may well be boiling down to the issues on technologies and strategic stabilities. More precisely, who gets to secure and set the rule for those newly emerging technology in the era of uncertainties. As a matter of fact, uh, during the Davos Forum a few years back, one of the remarkable and yet challenging conclusion was that the country that attained technologies that will steer so-called the fourth industrial revolutions were likely to dominate international politics for the years and decades to come. It was the UK and the United States that contributed greatly to the emergence of the first, second, and third industrial revolutions, and successfully set those the rule-based international law. Now it is major concern for many experts and the like, whether the rising countries such as China will gain a full access to those technologies that are necessary to lead the new trend and trajectory. And one notable empirical development is that the both Chinese civilian and the military leaders embraces such a belief so strongly that the three pillars of powers in China, namely the party, the state, and the military, all work in a unison to achieve that end. In 2015, uh, during the third plenum of the 12th Party Congress meeting, President Xi Jinping told his top military leaders that China must pursue so-called civil military integration policy as a concrete way to achieve Chinese dream of building strong nation and strong army. In this context, it is a great interest for many how the rapid technological advancement impacts international power dynamic in various ways. I'm honored to be here with four distinguished speakers who are all expert on their respective field, will educate us about the whole gamut of aspect in technology advancement, and will frankly share their view with us here. Okay, let me uh, quickly introduce them in alphabetical order that appear in your uh, session sketch. Dr. Tai Min Chong on my left from University of California, San Diego, will give us a talk on the technological advancement case in China particularly on the uh, subject of a civil military integration policy that I just introduced. Uh, Dr. Min eun Ju from World Intellectual Property Organization, Judicial uh, Institute, will educate us about uh, the importance of intellectual property rights and the diffu diffusion of technologies. And Dr. Uh, uh, Michael Sumayer from the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University will give us talk on the nexus between the technologies and national security. And uh, Dr. Jacob Bin uh, Ibrahim from Singapore Institute of Technology will share his thought from a fresh perspective from Southeast Asia. Who will also share his view with us on how the technology might impact on human society in a fundamental way beyond the traditional narrative of US-China uh, strategic rivalry. Um, each panel will uh, have a, uh, no more than 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes for its initial uh, presentations. And I won't give you any uh, warning sign, but we'd like to, uh, we would appreciate it greatly if you could uh, uh, deliver your talk within that time frame so that we can have more ample time during the Q&A session. Um, okay, so with that note, um, uh, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Chung. Okay. Yeah, you have okay. a time, many. thank you. Th thank you, Dong Ming, and, and thank you, Azan um, Institute, um, for inviting me, despite my very dubious reputation in the world. So, so um, what I wanted to do is to give the, a presentation as um, so based um, so like on what Dong Ming has prepared um, and mentioned about China and great power um, security and tech technology competition, and because this is sort of sort of um, one, one of those central areas that we will see of rivalry um, um, that will shape the long-term nature of the global tech technology order. 
What I've done is, uh, as a good academic, I've done a PowerPoint, um, but um, as, as, a, as a really efficient um, con con conference organizer, they refuse to allow you to use PowerPoints. So I've, we've, I've printed hard copies for you to take, take, take a look. So what I wanted to, first of all, to sort of, um, um, as we talk about tech technology competition and cooperation, is to identify three um, distinction characteristics of the state of the global tech technology order today to provide sort of a little bit of analytical context and focus that I'll be ad addressing for the rest of my pre presentation. And these three distri distinguishing characteristics. First is um, th there's the specific technologies themselves. There's uh, a lot of it on the emerging and found foundational technologies, what we know like 5G, artificial intelligence, quantum, advanced manufacturing, autonomous sy systems. So that's one important distinction area. A second er area uh, is the structure and agency of the global technology order itself. The, its globalized nature, um, sort of um, the balanced relationship between the state and the marketplace, the infrastructure and the various norms, etc. And the third dis distinction characteristic is that it's a broad application of the technologies that are used. Uh, are they commercial, national security, or do use in nature? And in all these three areas, what we're seeing is there's, there's far reaching disruption and upheaval and change that is taking place both right now and over, over the, the long term. This is often referred to as a revolution in technological affairs, or some people call it the, the fourth industrial revolution when it applies to some of the advanced manufacturing. And so what we're seeing is, as I said, this, this, this major transformation taking place. And at the same time, there's a fourth factor, um, a, a fourth interventionist factor that is reshaping this, this is global tech, tech technology order, and that is the US-China strategic competition. And when we see these mix of factors, um, it's like interacting and bouncing off each other and, um, and, and evolving, what we see is that um, there's fundamental um, um, overhaul that is taking place, and, there's, um, and, the, and the competition for leadership is very much up in the open. So in examining this major churn, this major transformation in the global technology, I want to offer sort of two main pers perspectives. The first is the, hi histor the historical international context. And the second is China's role in this ferment that has taken place, and in particular the role of the Chinese state to, to help us to understand. So in providing what is going on today in the global tech technology order compared to some of the historical trends itself. And this is something that's been uh, addressed over the last year, so over the last day at the, at the plenum, is that there's, there's often comparisons that uh, what we're seeing with the US-China technological com com competition today is a new Cold War. And this is sort of like as a reference to the Cold War of the late 20th century between the, the, the US and the Soviet Union. And in some ways, there's similarities, but the, the, the differences are much more fundamental. So when we look at sort of the late 20th century Cold War, especially between the Soviets um, and the US, that was sort of like um, in one domain, particularly this, the geostrategic military domain. And, and we see some of that with the US and China today. But a second, a very, uh, and a, in many ways, a more important domain, which, which is sort of compartmentalized and happened um, um, during that same pe period um, in the 80s and 90s, was the geoeconomic domain. And that was between the, the US and, J J and Japan. And so what you had in the 20th century was this compartmentalized Cold War on the Soviet Union, and Japan on different sides itself, on one of those, on the geostrategic and one on the geoeconomic. And in the middle, which was very relatively small, was what we would call the dual use, the civil military do domain. It was, it was important, but it was sort of a subcomponent of the geostrategic. Fast forward to today, when we look at 
sort of um, what's going on between the US and China itself. We, we basically, especially for China, China is what, what I would call, it's like um, a combination of the, the Soviet Union and J Japan, right? So we have said it's an integrated geo-economic and geo-strategic um, te technological um, challenger um, to the US. But it's, China is more than the sum of these two parts because the, the most important domain in many ways is the civil military um, integrated domain. And, um, and this, the reason why I'm sort of comparing what happened in the first Cold, Cold War was that in the first Cold War, the US developed a regulatory regimes to deal with the Soviet threat and the Japanese threats. And so we had on the, on the Soviet side was organizations, the arms, the export control regime, such as, so as COCOM. And on the, on the geo on the geoeconomic side, you have things like CFIUS, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the US. And it was very good when you had these, dealing with these separate compartment, compartmentalized threats. But the problem for the US today is that China particularly in the integrated space, the civil military, is that um, this falls through the gap. And this is where China poses many ways of uh, the most long-term um, like, um, challenge. And the US is trying to reform and update its legacy re re regimes. But to deal with this integrated um, challenge that China po poses requires, in many ways, a very, very different, a whole new set of, of thinking about this. And so I want to go through briefly, it's like, so what is the nature of, of the Chinese challenge? And um, a part of this is based upon a book that I'm finishing up. It's, so I would call, when we look at China, China is a technology security state, especially um, under sort of um, Xi Jinping. And a, and a technology security state is a state that focuses on sort of um, emphasizing national security issues, um, emphasizing sort of um, the development of their economic and technological capabilities in support of their national security concerns. And this is sort of very different than sort of um, his, the, the Chinese regimes before Xi Jinping, under from Deng Xiaoping to um, Jiang Zemin, to, um, to Hu Jintao, China was more of a developmental state where the focus was on economic de development. So as a tech, tech techno-security state itself, you have things like um, the importance of national security. So there's elements of national security, both externally and domestically. Um, the importance of developing a defense industrial apparatus. But also, um, and this is where the, the central focus for Xi Jinping is like, uh, he talks about the development of an integrated strategic innovation system, where the core, there's two core components. One is the civil military integration um, com component. And the second one is the development of emerging core strategic technologies itself, things like AI, um, things like um, sort of um, quantum, um, high-performance computing, hypersonics, and, and all those areas. And we see that there's major uh, mobilization of efforts across the Chinese um, science and technology systems, both on the civilian and on the military side. And so it's like, um, and, um, and so how does the international community grapple with this, and we have uh, what, it's like, I mean, even to today, there's all sorts of, of issues, like, what, how do we define Huawei, and what is Huawei's relationship um, with the Chinese state? And so, um, and so the debates that we're having, especially in the US to today, is like, um, do we then define that whatever that's going on in China is national security? And so cut China off, have a full-scale decoupling, or do we f be a lot more smarter and a lot more nuanced in saying, well, there's some national security, but the commercial side, which has been the engine of U.S. In innovation, is like um, we can't just do a sledgehammer approach. We have to be much more targeted. And this debate about do we go through limited decoupling or full-scale decoupling, that, that, that's some of the issues that we have to come, come confront. And all of this depends on our understanding of what this context and what is the real nature of this Chinese um, technology security state. I'll end it there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Achang, for uh, sharing your view.
um, China's technology advancement in the broader context of U.S.-China uh, security uh, 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 rivalry. Um, now we will come back uh, to discuss this more in Q and A session. But let me uh, uh, give floor to uh, Dr. Yeah. Min, please. Um, thank you, Professor Lee. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the Asin Institute for the uh, for the invitation. It is a great honor and privilege um, to be uh, to be part of this plenum. Um, while I'll be speaking in my personal capacity, I would like to uh, briefly introduce the organization with which I'm associated with, because I think that will help um, provide some context to the comments that I'll be um, I'll be uh, making. So the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, I don't know if you're familiar with it, um, um, is a specialized UN agency um, based in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, it is a custodian of 26 international treaties, including the Paris Convention for the, Industrial, for the Protection of Industrial Property of 1883, so it goes back to the 19th century, as well as the Bern Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works of 1886. Um, so that's what international organizations normally do, right? Norm said treaties. Um, what is a bit specific to WIPO and which makes it unique um, in the United Nations system is that it provides services to the private sector. So global intellectual, pro uh, intellectual property protection services and it is through the provision of such services that um, its revenue, 96% of its revenue is derived from that. Um, from that. And it's only 4% 4, 4 of its revenue that comes from member states. So it's a very um, special um, intergovernmental organization. And um, so what does, what does it actually mean? Um, in 2018, so that's um, last year, WIP received um, over a quarter million international patent applications and over 60,000 international trademark applications. So that's what, what, that's what the organization does. And it does uh, other things, but I think that's what's most relevant to the conversation today. So in my remarks, I'll address the global economic picture through the prism of intellectual property. Um, and um, let me start by sharing a few statistical figures in relation to global intellectual property filings, um, which may serve as an indicator of the geography of technology production and technology protection. So if you look at the global demand of patent protect protection in terms of um, patent filings, um, that has, over the last eight years, consistently outperformed global economic growth. So if the IMF projects or estimates um, economic growth at around 3% or 3.5%, um, the increase in global patent applications has been close to 6%. And that illustrates the critical component that the intellectual property-backed innovation um, um, places, um, is placed in, um, in the global commercial activity and global um, competition. So if you look at 2017, the most uh, recent year where data is available, innovators around the globe filed 3.2 million patent applications, 3.2 million. And uh, we're talking about the U.S.-China trade dispute, and intellectual property is a very big component of that. And you might be surprised, if, you're, if you haven't been following these figures, that out of the 3.2 million patent applications around the world, 1.4 million came from China. So China, the Chinese IP office, the patent office, in 2011 became the largest national patent office in the world. That's where China is at um, in the landscape of intellectual property. Um, and so in comparison to the 1.4 million from China, the second place is, um, goes to the United States with 607,000 applications. And uh, since we're talking about Korea's choice, and if you look at the place of Korea, Korea ranks fourth um, um, with 205,000 applications. So the record volume in China, what does it mean? It probably reflects um, the efforts, the actions undertaken both by Chinese companies, Chinese entities, uh, but also the foreign entities um, to protect in, um, innovation within China. 
um, we should not only talk about those three countries, looking um, at Asia more broadly, 65% of patent applications came from Asia. So not so much Europe and the United States, but 65% um, is Asia. So that's quite an important um, figure. So that, that um, related to national patent applications. So if we transform the national patent applications into international patent applications through the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is administered by, uh, by WIPO, and if you look at some of the figures there, we see similar um, trends of technology concentration. So in 2017, uh, China moved uh, into the second position in the use of the international patent system. Um, um, so the US was in the first place with 56,000 PCT applications, and China very um, close behind with 53,000. And it is um, expected that China will take over the United States, if not this year, next year. Um, and Asia accounted 20 years ago, Asia accounted to, for 4.7% of international patent applications. And um, now, so 20 years later, it's now the majority filer of PCT. And um, so I, why am I make, um, mentioning all these numbers? Because it's an important reflection of the, it's of an extraordinary transformation geopolitical, it's a reflection of the geopolitical transformation, the technology transformation, and the shift from, um, from the West um, to, um, to the East. Um, with that backdrop, let me just um, briefly touch upon the um, US-China um, trade confrontation and the intellectual property facet of that. Um, the focus on intellectual property in that trade confrontation is unsurprising, um, considering the uh, growing role of intellectual property. Um, one third of the value of, in, of um, global manufactured products um, can be um, um, sourced to intangible, intangible capital, that is technology branding designs. And therefore, it is natural that, um, that the trade war will um, come out as uh, an intellectual property um, war. And uh, the United States has, um, on the one hand, um, initiated unilateral actions under Section um, 301 of its um, Trade Act, but at the same time, it's also using a, the multilateral forum that World Trade um, Organization having initiated a complaint um, there. Um, you may be familiar with the WTO system, um, although, w, uh, although the US has um, initiated the complaint, um, the United States has been um, indicating some animosity <laughs> towards that organization, and the appellate body, which normally has seven members, is now currently down to three members, with one American, one Chinese, and one Indian, and it is expected that by the end of this year, there will be only one member. Um, so basically, um, the, uh, the WTO dispute settlement body, unless there is a dramatic change, will um, quite be uh, uh, disabled. Um, so it is, um, and this is despite the fact that of the 23 cases that the US filed against China, the US has won 19 cases with four pending. Um, but it is an, indeed an uneasy period um, for multilateralism, although with globalization, um, and it's a paradox because with globalization, it seems that there is greater need for multilateralism. Um, falling costs of international trade, more liberal trade policies that we have, seen, we have been seeing since the Second World War, and modern information communication technologies, um, they have all supported a shift to global protection, global production. Um, I remember seeing statistics from Boeing, um, which noted that to, pr to produce a Boeing um, 747, it works with over 6,000 suppliers from over 100 countries. So that's a s picture of the global supply chain 10 years ago, probably. That seems to be changing, and technology is changing that. Um, so how is it changing that? Um, 
now we're moving on to robotics. We're moving on to automated manufacturing. Um, and with these new um, disruptive technologies, the production places are changing. We're seeing a, uh, a transformation of that. And we are sometimes seeing that the production is coming closer to the end consumer and perhaps a bit further away from trade. So whereas the, um, the technologies of the 20th century information and communication technologies have, have played a greater facilitative role um, in terms of trade, the newer technologies um, are perhaps um, playing a uh, contributory role, if, if, um, if that can be said, um, towards protectionism and perhaps even nationalism. When we look at artificial intelligence, for example, and we look at the government policies that are taken towards artificial intelligence, is, uh, we're seeing more and more nationalistic um, um, colors coming through. Um, so I think I would um, end my remarks there and then probably continue uh, with in, the, in the conversation. All right. Okay, doctor. Please. All right. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Solmeyer, and I've learned that the number one way to guarantee a revolt in the classroom is to go over your time. So I'm giving my own countdown here. And uh, I first want to thank, naturally, uh, Chai Bong and the whole uh, Asan family for the invitation. It's a long way to come, but I wouldn't miss it. Uh, it's great to be here. And I also want to really make sure that we, we note this is an important topic, obviously, but the agenda at the plenum is so crowded with important issues. Uh, I really want to compliment them for making sure and uh, that there's time for this topic. It is the battleground for the future of economics, of diplomacy, of politics, and military competition. It's not isolated to one theme. It will underpin, and it is underpinning it all. So I want to uh, thank the plenum for making sure there's time for this and thank you for coming. I'd be remiss not to thank also my previous employer, the wonderful people at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. They're the ones who initially hooked me up with the relationship here. But now I work at uh, Georgetown's uh, newest research center where we study artificial intelligence and national security. We got to keep an eye on the ball of things beyond cyber as much as it's been a great job and area of interest for, for me and I know a lot of our colleagues. There's more coming. So you got to be able not just to keep up with the cyber turbo geeks like me, right, on computers, but you got to be, you got to know the 5G work, the AI work, quantum computing, all this stuff. It doesn't stop. So we're working on that hard at Georgetown. Come by and visit anytime. Uh, my interest is, uh, remains in the area, though, of uh, cyber operations and national security. So what I want to talk with you a little bit about today, we just heard a wonderful set of remarks about intellectual property theft. I want to talk to you about a different threat. I'm not trying to say it's, it's more or worse. I want to talk to you about a different threat, and that's the threat of indiscriminate destruction. Right? Indiscriminate destruction. Right? And then I want to tell you a little bit about a case of that. The case is called Not Petia. I'll tell you about what that is. I'll tell you about what Petia is and then why this is not that. But the weapon was called Not Petia. And then I, I want to conclude with how uh, international diplomacy actually worked hard to make sure that there was international condemnation around this incident. And as a call going forward that alliance relationships are more important than ever as we think about these kinds of challenges. So that's my plan, okay? Talk about indiscriminate destruction, all right? We, we don't start small here in, the, in national security land. The, the issue here is that there's not just one cyber threat, all right? And I, I wanna condition everybody to making sure that the mind is always open to new problems. Yes, new opportunities for technology development and economic gain, but also new opportunities that our adversaries and competitors will use to exploit this technology. One that we saw uh, really come up with two kinds of attacks in 2017 and uh, recent years involve indiscriminate spread and destruction. In South Korea here, I'm, I'm sure folks are familiar with an incident around something called WannaCry. We are not great marketing experts in cybersecurity. These names don't make sense, right? But 
This is what they're called. Right? So WannaCry was uh, spread by uh, the North Korean regime, indiscriminate spread throughout the world. And the incident that I was referring to, NotPetya, was spread indiscriminately by the Russians. Has anyone heard of, of NotPetya? I can't get out of the classroom mode. Show of hands here. Anybody ever heard? We got one. All right. All right. Russian. <laughs> OK, great. No, we got one, one name here. And uh, we won't cold call. This isn't the first year of law school on, on what was done. But when you think about the scale of damage, right? when you think about stealing intellectual property, when you think about uh, the costs, it is true no one has ever been killed by a cyber attack. But when you think about the cumulative effects of what we've seen over the decades, the damage is staggering. With NotPetya, the financial damage was $10 billion globally, and this thing spread in seconds. Okay? We're not talking about cumulative hack by hack, needle by needle. No, we're talking about indiscriminate spread. This is what a worm is, classroom teaching, right? A worm spreads and self-propagates, right? All on its own, without user interaction. And NotPetya contained a very dangerous payload. And what it did was while it, it thought it was asking you for money, and you thought you were being asked to pay in the fund currency of Bitcoin, Right, to contribute to some criminal scheme. Secretly, quietly, behind the scenes, it was erasing your data. Right, that's the tweet version of what's going on. Petia was the ransomware, and so while it looked like it was asking you for money, this was not Petia because it was not actually asking you for a ransom. It was destroying what you had. $10 billion globally of information and the reconstitution costs what was it? What was going on here? Well, we, we've learned that the Russians were targeting Ukraine, and the way they were doing it was exploiting a piece of tax software. Yes, tax. Everybody's got to pay taxes. So basically, anybody that was doing business in Ukraine was vulnerable, right, with this tax software to pay. Uh, this dangerous stuff. And so you get a company like Maersk International Shipping gets completely brought to its knees. Wonderful article and upcoming book by Andy Greenberg of Wired Magazine. You can read a lot more about how Maersk and others were devastated. But the point I really want to lead you with is it galvanized not just an international response by one country, usually been the United States first to name and shame. Maybe we throw some indictments on the table, maybe some sanctions. We got over 10 countries this time to come out and make a coordinated response against the Russians to say, this kind of indiscriminate destruction really is, is unacceptable on a global level. And my appeal to you as we think about how threats continue to grow in the digital landscape, this cannot just be one company at a time or one government at a time. There is a role for international diplomats. There is a role for international diplomacy and alliances. And I think we've actually seen some progress Right, over the last couple years and getting a better international coalition to come together right, to condemn the kinds of indiscriminate behavior that we've been seeing more and more of. And what I want to try to do is to then say that that's the, a good first level international effort to combat this kind of destruction. There's been a new round at the United Nations under this group of governmental experts for the UN experts in the room, right? There's a GGE process that has been restarted last week or two to get more institutionalized support against this type of behavior. Nations also have a, a role here in their, in their own right. And part of this comes down to deciding real matters of public policy about who's accountable. Who's accountable? for protecting citizens and companies online. We don't have a lot of consensus about that internationally. We don't even have a ton of consensus about that domestically within countries. So your international level has got to be diplomacy, both at the UN and through alliances. Your national level has got to think about real hard public policy making, about accountability in the digital landscape. And finally, the companies themselves and the institutions we rely on can do a lot to be harder to hack. We're not talking about perfect defense, just like we would never talk about perfect defense in any other area of national security. But that doesn't mean you leave yourself open and you leave your citizens and your clients open to excessive risk. 
we thought the insurance right, world might be able to help on this, right? But imagine, put your lawyer hats on for a minute, imagine the litigation claims that you can imagine between an insurance company saying, whoa, this was not covered, a not petty, a destructive attack was not covered in a standard policy. That sounds like an act of war. And you could imagine a company that paid a lot for cyber insurance saying, well, no one declared war. They just destroyed all my stuff. Why do you think I had an insurance policy? That's what insurance for. We don't have one mechanism available to dealing with this. Right? So governments, companies in the international arena are going to be vital to reducing risk. Again, not eliminating, but reducing the risk that these kinds of cyber attacks will continue to have the force that they will going forward. I'll stop it there and look forward to questions and discussion at the end. Can I? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to also echo my thank to Assam uh, Institute for inviting me here. This is my first time here, and I hope this will not be the last. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to thank also for the topic. As I understand, this is a new topic, and of course, technology is something which we're all familiar with, but of course, we are looking at this from a public policy point of view. I spent seven years as the Minister for Communications and Information dealing with the issues that uh, Robert just mentioned. Uh, about cybersecurity and, of course, data protection. We know that uh, technology, of course, has all the benefits, and I won't go down that road. And uh, in, in, in our region, Southeast Asia, for example, 600 million people, new middle class is emerging. There's a lot of push for smart nation initiatives, e-commerce, because that's the only way for us to lift people out of poverty. So imagine a small trader in the middle of Jakarta, Indonesia, able to sell to somebody not only in the region but beyond the region, therefore lifting him out of poverty. Yet we know that uh, we expect disputes involving science and technology will occur. Our social media platforms, for example, operating in different countries, and of course, intellectual property rights. So recently, for example, we have Australia, including UK, also moving ahead with laws on penalties on social media platforms regarding hate speech content on their platforms. So there's been a lot of discussions on how we can deal with also security breaches. So I will confine my discussion to just two matters, which is data protection, and cybersecurity, of course, basically. Um, we know that there are some limitations in terms of how technology can be utilized, but at a global level, I think we have to arrive at some consensus on the restrictions or limitations that we can place on new technologies, yet at the same time, to allow countries to benefit from technology and technology-related services for their people. So that's the dilemma. How do you ensure that I can benefit from that technology and yet at the same time protect? So the issue of data and data protection, for example, plays a very crucial role in a digitalized economy where rapid adoption of cloud computing, big data, 5G, and so on, will increase the need for data to flow across geographical boundaries. So it's therefore important to minimize the restrictions that would impede cross-border data flows. More than 100 countries have actually enacted some form of data protection or privacy law that generally focus on the protection and rights of the individual, but many of these laws differ in implementation and enforcement. Furthermore, while some of the obligations do not necessarily hinder cross-border data flows, the conditions imposed, coupled with the lack of harmonization of global data protection standards, pose operational and organizational challenges for companies operating in multiple jurisdictions. Businesses often have to grapple with a patchwork of different data protection laws in various jurisdictions, which may add to compliance costs. So there have been attempts at harmonizing data protection systems internationally and regionally, such as the OECD Privacy Principles, the APAC Privacy Framework, and the ASEAN Framework on Personal Data Protection. But most of these systems are voluntary, and they do not provide for clear and consistent implementation of standards by jurisdictions. In addition, unlike multilateral rules governing trade, there are few international treaties targeting data protection. So given the multifaceted nature of cross-border data flows, it is important for different jurisdictions to collaborate on solutions to facilitate cross-border data flow. So just one example is the APEC Cross-Border Privacy Rules, or CBPR, and the Privacy Recognition Pro Processes System, in which my country, Singapore, has applied to join in. These are exemplary models of multilateral arrangements that incorporate harmonization of rules to help countries level up their data protection standard and facilitate the safe and the secure transfer of data across geographical borders. So participation in APEC will allow Singapore to work with like-minded economies to promote economic leakages and regional economic integration. So we think cross-border data flows should be facilitated. 
Countries and regulators also have to assess new technologies to meet their own internal requirements. And here, I don't think we can have a global position other than respecting each nation's prerogative to make decisions in their own interests. The question has always been asked about our position on 5G. Singapore, for example, encourages our telecom operators, including our mobile network operators, to ensure vendor diversity to mitigate risk from dependency on any one vendor. In addition, operators should ensure that the performance and the reliability of equipment purchased from vendors meet their com commercial operational needs and our regulatory requirements, including those pertaining to quality of service, resilience, and security. So we remain open, and yet we have certain rules by which we expect them to conform to. At the same time, countries are also actively developing their military cyber capabilities and doctrine, ranging from offensive to defensive cyber capabilities. But there are presently no universally agreed norms governing these capabilities, such as the protection of critical infrastructure from cyber attacks, non-interference in political process, or economic espionage. Many countries are also embarking to digitalize the economy and deploy more smart technologies. Cybersecurity, we believe, is a key enabler to these efforts, an important area for both cooperation and, unfortunately, disputes. Government, businesses, and consumers must feel secure that their data and transactions are not in every compromise. So for countries, a breach into the critical information infrastructure, or CIIs, can have detrimental effects. So for this reason alone, there is a need for some form of global consensus on the management of the security of such CIIs, and countries must feel safe from cyber attacks. So we heard about the UN efforts, the UNGGE started in 2004, and they have sort of had a stall in 2007, and now they're starting again. Uh, 2017, sorry. So at uh, 2015, uh, the UNGG meeting, for example, agreed on 11 voluntary non-binding norms of responsible state behavior, including reframing from damaging CIIs using ICTs, protecting critical infrastructure from ICT threats, and investigating malicious activity emanating from states' territory and responding to requests for assistance. Quite a mouthful, but these norms, we believe, are important. And this was unanimously adopted by the UN G General Assembly in 2015. And since then, as I mentioned earlier, at the last UNG in 2018, the UNG process had been restarted. And there's another group called the Open-Ended Working Group proposed by the Russians to look at the security of the cybersphere, which includes everyone who's a UN member. The UNGG is only 25 countries, but the OEWG includes everyone. So there are two UN process achieving, wanting to achieve the same outcome to develop rules and principles of responsible behavior of states, and most importantly, develop possible cooperative measures to address existing and potential threats. So we believe in ASEAN and Singapore that it's important for us to support these efforts at the UN level. More importantly, how we can promote international voluntary cyber norms of responsible state behavior and confidence building measures of CBMs in cyberspace. So in Singapore, for example, we started the Singapore International Cyber Week. The fourth edition will be this year, 1st to the 3rd of October. Please do come down to Singapore and uh, share some of your uh, wisdom on how we can move forward the process. But cyber norms and cybersecurity is such an important thing that the weakest link has also to be addressed. So in our part of the world, we have started to collaborate among the different countries to build capacity. And so Singapore has launched a capacity building fund that helps to train cybersecurity professionals in the region. And at the same time, we believe that the way forward is to also share information. So we have signed MOUs with several countries to be able to us to share, so including what happened with NotPetya, WannaCry, and so on and so forth, so that we know what happened, because generally countries would not want to admit there had been attacked, but if there had been attacked, that's valuable information for us to prevent the next attack. Um, Singapore, as you know, is not free from such attacks. Uh, we will learn and continue to share this information with like-minded country because we believe that's the only way we can deal with this threat. Finally, let me turn to the internet and social media platforms. Uh, we heard the recent attack in Christchurch, for example, that governments are now looking seriously at how social media and its impact on societies. And this is something in which we're all too familiar with, that fake news can be peddled, disinformation can be peddled easily on the internet. Um, it has some outcomes that we do not desire, like the outcome of elections, and it can also trigger conflicts between countries. So, and of course, we know the internet has also been used to recruit supporters for hate and terrorist groups. So what should be done? 
More importantly, how far should we regulate the internet? Print media, for example, in most countries are regulated. Should the internet go the same way? So we heard that the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, uh, believes that social media have a responsibility, social media companies have a responsibility to safeguard their platforms being hijacked by terrorist group. Australia has introduced legislation. The UK has released a white paper on managing content on the internet. Restrictions on the internet for speech or for free speech are not new. On one extreme is China's sophisticated system of censoring political debate, hate speech, and pornography on the internet. The other extreme of unfettered freedom on the internet is increasingly untenable to many parts of the world. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand argues that there must be a middle ground, and she's arguing for an international consensus as these platforms are global. Mark Zuckerberg wrote an op-ed in Washington Post asking for government to regulate the internet. The question should be asked is, what should Facebook also do to help us to regulate the internet? So these are indeed inter interesting times. In the physical world, we have uh, rules for broadcasters, for video, uh, for TV and, and film, and we have ratings and classification system, but such a system does not exist on the internet. And so it's clear that, yet it's not so clear when it comes to certain aspects of the internet. We know there's a global consensus on the need to block and ban, for example, child pornography. However, for live streaming, even though the case of the Christchurch attack is clear, some would argue that unfettered live streaming is a useful means of ensuring transparency and scrutiny of the police, for example. So countries like Singapore, as you know, are introducing legislation to deal with fake news and disinformation online, but it's clear that opinions and point of views on many matters, including on the performance of the government, are not covered in this legislation, yet there are concerns in the intent by the implementation of such a legislation. So I believe it is worth for us to monitor this development. Clearly, there cannot be unfettered freedom on the internet. As one report noted, the tech will self-image of exceptionalism needed to end. So the regulation of the internet is moving closer to what we are familiar with the broadcasting world, but the broadcasting world is also being disrupted by the internet, thereby requiring a new way to regulate it. So in all likelihood, we believe there will be a convergence. Where that convergence will be is really up for discussion. So we all know that every technology lends itself to either doing good or harm to the user. Ultimately, it is the decision of the policymakers to plan how this technology should be used and regulated in their respective jurisdictions. We can choose to collaborate or compete in developing technologies, yet it's becoming clear that for some technologies, a global consensus on working together is needed. So for example, we see the responsible behavior in cyberspace has already gained global attention, the UN process. Regulating the, inter uh, the content on the internet and social media is now becoming an urgent priority. In other emerging technologies, careful con consideration has also to be made on the need for some consensus, global consensus. Take, for example, the development of AI in autonomous vehicles. There's the issue of safety of AIs, and this is a global concern. Should government enforce regulations on these AVs to protect public life in the case of accident? This is an ethical issue which requires global attention as technological, technological development is not value neutral. So countries have to make their own calculations, bearing in mind their, their local interests, but yet as responsible members of the global community, some global consensus is needed in some of these emerging technologies. So I'll end my comments here and look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, uh, for your uh, thoughtful, um, informative uh, presentation. Uh, now, all four speakers deliver and share their respective views on the subject matter, and, and we're about more than halfway through and uh, 40 minutes left. So in order to better use of the time to draw a meaningful conclusion out of this session, rather than continue to discuss on, on the technology itself, I'd like to ask more uh, specific question for each speaker in a broader context on how the free versus government regulated technology advancement now playing out in the international arena. And more importantly, what does this all mean in the context of strategic stability? Okay. Um, I have a question for Dr. Chong. Maybe um, you can answer this in maybe three to four minutes. But uh, you once mentioned that uh, by the year 2035, perhaps uh, Chinese military technological advancement will reach a certain level. Mm. May not be on par with the United States, but maybe 15 years. 15 years ago, besides you and a few other 
no one really expected that China's technological breakthrough were likely to move forward in a linear fashion, right? But despite the downplaying China's indigenous technological foundation, you may also concur with the widespread claim that China is so -called, has so-called pockets of excellence, okay? such as aerospace uh, uh, technology that are essential in supporting um, um, technology such as GI, uh, AI and 5G and so on. Uh, the specific question is this. In order to foster its infant industries, the Ministry of De Industry and Information Technology under the State Council uh, worked closely with those eight to 10 uh, defense enterprises that include one in aerospace and electronics. I'm curious to know what are the role of the Central Military Commission, CMC, of the party uh, on the whole dynamics and endeavor in pursuing high-end technology? I think mm -hmm. answering that question will tell us a bit about the issues surrounding the role of military on, on Chinese technological advancements. Okay. okay. So um, thank you, Domingue, for um, um, a, a, a very difficult question. So, um, so broadly, I mean, one of the reasons why China has been able to catch up um, quite quickly um, over the last 15, 20 years was that, especially on the military side, but also in, on the commercial side, China had what we call an, ab an absorption-based model of technology development. It, had, it was very good at um, bringing in, identifying and bringing in technologies from all around the, the world. And so they did it in things like high-speed trains, on military aviation, et cetera. And, and they called this sort of um, re-innovation, the ability to uh, absorb what, what's there and then turn it into their, their own thing. What we see under Xi Jinping now is this pivot from the absorption model to an original innovation model that China sees that if it's going to get into the command and um, um, so you can take charge of the command and heights of the global in the innovation sectors, etc., it also needs to engage on the research and development, and especially in these emerging areas. So that's why it's um, it's mobilizing its resources on AI, on quantum, on 5G, uh, and, and all these areas. And one reason why they've been um, why, why the Chinese authorities have been actually quite good in this, is that um, I call this what, what, what the Chinese authorities were, and this is in reference to the, the Central Military Commission and various others, is that the, the Chinese approach to technology development is what we call, it's a selective authoritarian mobilization model. It, given the nature of the Chinese political system, it's an authoritarian system, um, and given that Xi Jinping is very much in charge, what they do is that they select a few key areas where they can um, throw a lot of resources, so it's AI is one particular area, but a number of others. And then the authoritarian mobile system is that it's, it's a top down and it's mobilized. So what the authorities can do is they mobilize across the whole um, e economic system. They bring in the civilian, the military, and, um, um, and, sort of, uh, and foreign players to be able to concentrate on these issues. And this sort of, sort of ex explains why they are able to now make much faster pro 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 progress. It's, a, it's very different than what we see in the US and, and other places, which it's much more of a bottom-up, much more market-driven mo 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 model itself. And so what we see is these, these very con contrasting models of it's like um, technology development at the frontier. The Chinese model, this, this, this much more authoritarian approach compared to the much more capitalist and market-driven approaches. And it's, like, um, and it's a big question of who has the right model itself. But it's like what, what we see is that these different models are going to be contending for leadership over the next couple of decades. Uh, both the CMC and State Council work together to do yes, that. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so it's like, I mean, so at, because it's at the very top, it's, it's, it's top down. So it's like, um, it's integrated across. So the Central Military Commission, the State Council, um, the Politburo, um, and they have, and they design a number of special organizations, mm -hmm. things like the Special Central Com um, Commission, um, the Integrated Civil Military Development Commission that's been, uh, um, there and so that provides the leadership and then the implementation implementation me 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 mechanisms like the ministry that, that you refer to and and others so it's like it's very much of a of a whole of government an integrated mod model of des of design. Okay. All right, thank you, um, um, Dr. Min. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentations and I learned quite a bit from your informative talk. Um, 
since China joined WTO in 2001 um, and invited to be part of this integrated process of globalization, and uh, so-called under the policy, uh, foreign policy approach, so-called extension and engagement under the um, Clinton administration, China is one of uh, those countries that benefited uh, most arguably uh, and owes to international community and the rule-based international order set by the Western world. And many people argue that China must be a responsible stakeholder. And I'm also quite surprised to uh, uh, find out that out of 3.2 million patents, 1.4 are actually coming from China. Um, the first question is, related to that question is, what are the quality of those patents? I don't know if you can measure that or not, but uh, that's the first question. And second question is, if the intellectual property rights uh, were uh, reform war to be occurred um, uh, through the uh, trade war negotiation, will that will hamper the technolo technology diffusion uh, in favor of China? Okay. Um, thank you, um, Professor Lee, for, um, for those questions. Um, of course, the quality of patents um, emanating from China is, is debatable. Is debatable, and also um, different countries have different patent systems, and um, certain countries have utility model system, which is counted separately from the patent um, um, system, and certain countries don't have. Certain countries have petty patents. Um, so. Um, I think if we go into that debate, um, um, there isn't a, uh, an answer that will be uh, black and white. Um, I guess the volume is a reflection of something. I think that's the, that, that's the only uh, point that I wanted to make. Um, and the second question of whether greater intellectual property protection will uh, promote technology diffusion. Um, it's never black and white, and there are a lot of shades of gray, and that is not a very satisfactory answer to the to the to the <laughs> to the moderator nor the audience. But I think that's the, that's the, that's a fact of life. Um, I think from the perspective of WIPO, what we like to say is not intellectual property protection that contributes to economic growth or to innovation, but is the utilization of the intellectual property system, which is different from intellectual property protection. The utilization, because the intellectual property system provides for protection, but it also provides for ex exceptions and limitation. And it's really up to each country to utilize that system in the best way it can. Um, and if China does that, then it will assist in technology diffusion, as it has many other countries. And I think what I would like also like to mention, and this is quite well known to, the, uh, to people familiar to, the intellect, to, to intellectual property, but what is happening between US and China is really not an exception. And we've been seeing it happen over and over and over. And what we may be less known is that in the 19th century, um, the United States was probably the biggest um, appropriator of intellectual <laughs> property, and there was a big fight between the US and the UK, and Charles Dickens is um, um, reported to have gone to the US and come back to the UK and have died of fury because of the lack of protection in the United States of his copyrighted works. Because until 1891, despite the US Constitution providing for copyright protection and patent protection, until 1891, the US did not protect the copyright works of foreign authors. So the, UK, the US does that, and what does the UK do? So the UK decides to not protect the works of US authors. So Charles Dickens does not get protected in the US, and Edgar Allan Poe does not get protected in the US, uh, okay. in the UK. <laughs> it's tit for tat. And that has continued. It comes in, it, it goes up and down. It's, it's not something new, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And we, we talk about um, the IP theft by China. And perhaps what is less known is that US also complains about the lack of sufficient copyright protection in Switzerland, and it has um, <laughs> provided certain um, 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 milder <laughs> sanctions um, towards Switzerland, and also for Canada for patents. Um, so it's 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 a it's a very complex um, landscape, and uh, I guess I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sumayer, I think you introduced us uh, one of the most intriguing factual development on uh, the dynamic between technology and national security. 
Um, I think they're very intertwined. Um, uh, two weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, in fact, I was in DC and heard about the launch of so-called CPDC, the Committee on the Prison Danger in China. Um, later, I looked it up and uh, um, and find out that uh, as part of a, part of the inaugural speech that former Speaker uh, uh, Gingrich and um, and then former White House Chief Strategist Stephen Banner mentioned that China has become a first-rated economic and military power. It's not my word; it's their word. But especially Speaker uh, Gingrich uh, pointed out that the U.S. company such as AT&T is not interested in leading the advancement of 5G technologies for the nation. Instead, the company chose to spend $85 billion of buying Warner Brothers, uh, looking after its own cor uh, uh, corporate interest. Uh, speaker thinks that the Department of Defense now has to play a bigger role, okay? Government regulated policy on diffusion of the technology. In fact, the last week, the Pentagon of the United States just announced that it will invest further in space satellite. And appears that the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, uh, is set to uh, take a greater role in promoting this, uh, what do you call the defense conversion, uh, spin-off technology for the dual-use technology. Um, I'm curious to know whether you think that the current uh, Trump administration is, is moving in right direction uh, maintaining its strategic stability in the midst of this rising uncertainty. Uh, if you can answer them in the broader context of national security uh, aspect and, and also global context, yeah. Sure, uh, you know, it's probably easier to do uh, over a four hour seminar, but the short version, <laughs> right, would, uh, you know, would, would try to say, look, the, the strategic stability implications of what you've asked about are, are very serious. And we're very used to strategic stability being the realm of the nuclear balance or missile defense or conventional prompt global strike. And you know, even in the last 10 years, people have learned to say, oh, and cyber, right, to that conversation. And just as people are remembering that cyber operations and cybersecurity are part of the uh, strategic stability balance. Oh wait, now we also have to make sure that these discussions about uh, fifth generation technology are part of that conversation as well, among the other technologies we've been talking about today. Look, the part of the issue is that th this is, like we talked about with the cyber, it's not just one technology, it's not just one threat or, or one kind of opportunity. There's a lot, of, a lot of different issues going on there. One of them is spectrum management. Now, the fastest way to lose an audience is to start talking about different gigahertz bands on the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's exactly what I'd like to do is, okay, one person laughed for those <laughs> reporting that I just wanted, wanted known that there was a general chuckle. Uh, the, the issue is that there's not just one approach to 5G when you're talking about the spectrum. There's, to simplify, a lower band set of opportunities that is below, roughly below six gigahertz. And then there are the opportunities above about 26 gigahertz. And there are different opportunities and different challenges in both of those parts of the spectrum. Uh, no matter what US companies decide to do, no matter what the relationship is and isn't with the government or the Defense Department, you're going to have to resolve some of these fundamental decisions about spectrum management. And because they are going to implicate how uh, countries are able to maintain strategic stability uh, and also continue to pursue their own interests, though, uh, abroad. I, I would note that we're in Korea. Just a couple weeks ago, obviously you know we're in Korea, but just a, you know, a couple weeks ago, uh, SK Telecom uh, did a big uh, announcement, a big rollout. I think it was maybe even been called 5G Day, right, here. So uh, there's a lot of hedging that, that they've done wisely across both ends of that spectrum. So it's not always an either or type of choice, but we're seeing it play out, not just in the US and uh, strategic stability issues with the usual people like Russia and China, but also countries like Korea, Japan, and others as well. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Abraham, I have a question for you as well. Um, 
Dr. John Eikenberry, one of the uh, great thinkers and student of international politics, once uh, argued that the rise of China is, in fact, uh, a major drama of the 21st century. Uh, and many East Asian states, in fact, including the one in Southeast Asia, uh, may not be able to formulate and implement their uh, respective foreign policy without considering China factor. And unlike the structural realist, I don't think that China has this irredentist ambition, but in recent years, one major salient development is China's push for so-called Belt and Road initiatives that are changing geopolitics of Asia, connecting the landmass in, in Eurasian continent. Particularly, uh, China's overstretching effort uh, in connecting and increasing its own technological cooperations uh, with regional countries that are affiliated with Belt and Road Initiative project is quite notable. One of the good example is uh, CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. In the process of providing infrastructure building, uh, Beijing is utilizing its newly found tools of economic statecraft. And Beijing is determined to help a Pakistan government on its military modernizations program. For example, uh, China recently launched its own version of a GPS system, which is Beidou Satellite. Uh, Beijing is providing them with the fraction of the original cost and almost free of charge. My question to you is, in the near future, if Beijing is asking to cooperate jointly uh, in an effort on the developing on certain technology, uh, what might be your choice? Um, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to singling out to you, but, but this is kind of question that we all, also, also South Korea, uh, faces today. Um, because you talked about the importance of sharing information and, and, and uh, working together globally. Second related question is beyond the choice of competitions or cooperations, what does this uh, technology mean for the human society and the global community as a whole? Uh, we would appreciate it greatly if you can share your thought and wisdom and insight sure. with us. Uh, today. Thank you very much. I think the BRI is something which we cannot ignore. And in fact, just recently, maybe this week or last week, my prime minister just met a Chinese official and mentioned that it is an area in which we can co collaborate and cooperate. I think Singapore is a small country. ASEAN is a region which is growing. Uh, see cooperation as a way out. But at the same time, as I mentioned in my speech, we always need to preserve our independence and our own national interests. So we remain open. Because as there are more choices, I think it gives us a sort of a diversity of options to see what's the best approach to take. So I mentioned the example of cybersecurity um, cooperation, which I started when I was minister in charge of cybersecurity, and realizing that the best way is to cooperate with like-minded countries to see how we can share information, do capacity building. In fact, we are going to launch a cybersecurity center of excellence in Singapore um, so that we can actually use that to further research and share that information with countries in the region and beyond. So I think as a country and as a region, we've always remained open to cooperation. Uh, but what it means for each country is not something that any member of ASEAN can dictate. It's for each country to make their own calculations. Singapore, as you know, is a small country, right? And, and so we have to observe all of this very carefully in terms of our own national interests because our sovereignty is something which we fought very hard to secure and we have to guard it very jealously. Yet at the same time, we realize that technology is the way out for us to uplift our people, to provide better paying jobs. And at the same time, we realize it's also a way for us to help countries in the region. So we, we remain on that sort of even keel to cooperate as much as possible, yet at the same time, we have to measure that against our own national interests. So that's, that's my response to your first question. Your second question about technology itself, I mean, this is something which I have an interest, even when I was minister, that we have cannot see technology in a vacuum. We have to see it in the context of society, what it can do to society. I've always loved to give this example that human cloning is actually a lot, uh, is, is, is possible to do, but there's a global consensus that we shouldn't do it because there's a moral and ethical issue. I think the debate about technology should also take such a coloration because at the end of the day, it's not neutral. Right? Uh, the use of AI, for example, which we are investing heavily in Singapore, um, also has to be balanced against the displacement of workers, right? the kinds of uncertainty they place on a middle-aged worker at the age of 40. I was reading an article the other day in the New York Times that mentioned the fact that it is not just something that you can transit from being 
maybe a, a, a nurse one day and to an IT specialist the next day. Your whole identity is being reshaped as you change from one profession to another, and you're 45, paying mortgage, having kids to support, and grandparents, it's not an easy transition. So society as a government will have to think about the implication of how technology can be implemented in the best way possible. So in Singapore, for example, we came up with a blueprint called Digital Readiness Blueprint, because we have to prepare society for that. And in fact, for AI, we've released earlier this year at Davos uh, an AI framework that we believe should be the basis for some global discussion. So I think these are the kinds of issues that we like to see happening. Um, if you look, for example, in the maritime industry, you have IMO. In the airline industry, you have ICAO. But in cybersecurity and all the technologies that's emerging, there's no sort of global platform discussion other than the UN. And I, and I think the implications for what that means for countries have to be thought through very carefully. The security angle is very important. There's no doubt about that. Some countries have a lot more at stake compared to others. Yet at the same time, we know that a small attack like Petya or WannaCry to a country like Singapore, it can disrupt tremendously. You know, So we've taken the bold step of doing internet separation, uh, very painful for my civil servants when I did it as a minister. So uh, when I was a minister, I had two computers on my table, one connected to the internet, one not connected to the internet. And we decided that's the best way to go. But it's never 100%, we know that, right? So there are issues that we have to discuss on how we can go forward. And I think this cannot be done just at the local and national level, but it has to be done at the international level. Okay, thank you, uh, um, Dr. Um, Abraham. I think what you have said is very important. I, as a global community, we have to work together uh, to minimize the negative consequences of those, uh, some of the technologies. Um, now we have less than 20 minutes. I'd like to invite one or two uh, questions from floor, and um, if you have any, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, please, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Olga Kresniak. Uh, I'm a researcher of diplomatic studies. And my question for Michael, so you mentioned uh, partly a little bit about how uh, cybersecurity can be addressed by diplomacy. So uh, I, I would like to ask you about cybersecurity dilemma. So it's, uh, it's an issue when um, <laughs> the line between offense and defense uh, couldn't be distinguished. And uh, it's about to understand intentions of the other side. Uh, why some cyber attacks can happen. So sometimes it just could be uh, deterrence, uh, unnecessary just for some, to, to, uh, to bring some damage. Uh, anyway, uh, so um, according to the cybersecurity dilemma, um, uh, those issues can be addressed by diplomacy, by, uh, for example, summit diplomacy when uh, leaders, state leaders can meet. And one of the examples would be uh, during the Obama administration, Obama himself, he met uh, Xi Jinping, uh, and one of the issues would be to uh, discuss uh, cyber threats. And uh, it's been uh, somehow well, addressed, I guess. Well, another example was not, <laughs> was not addressed, but uh, it's a, a politics um, extension, uh, North Korea, and uh, a, few, a few years ago, and its cyber, uh, cyber attacks uh, against uh, Sony and uh, Korean banks. So we see it's like a politics. Or a recent, you mentioned about this uh, Chinese attacks on the uh, Australian parliament. So we see it's extension of politics. So my question, uh, what do you think about how it can be addressed uh, by summit diplomacy when leaders maybe talk to each other and they discuss, or probably they need to stop, or maybe to leave in these cyber threats and cyber attacks? Thank you. Hi, I'm um, uh, Sui Han Lee from the Asan Institute. I have a question. Uh, a lot of the discussion has been mostly in sort of the national security space, but I, I read recently that the African Union had actually released a plan to increase the innovation policy of Africa by 2024. I was thinking what, if, what you would think about uh, if the idea of cybersecurity and innovation as a development issue. So for instance, would it be plausible to give Afri uh, select African countries perhaps special and differentiated treatment in situation of leapfrogging, if that was a very viable option for economies? And I'd, I'd like to hear what you uh, thought about that. Thank you. I'm happy to. Yeah. I'll ask I'll, on the second question. Sure, from, but you go first, Mike. OK, if you say so. Uh, so the first question. Uh, for those you know keeping score at home, was about the cybersecurity dilemma, right? Which uh, borrows off of uh, uh, 
phrase and a concept that academics have been talking about for decades, just generally known as the security dilemma, right? which is when one country begins to acquire weapons that look offensive, right? then other states get nervous. And they begin to acquire capabilities and weapons that look offensive. And all of a sudden, you're in a spiral, and everyone's more dangerous and less secure than when they started. And you can imagine the theory goes, it goes the other way when you invest in defense technologies and, and the dilemma becomes more secure uh, looking that way. So the challenge for people looking at cyber operations is, are these cyber weapons, are they more offensive? Do they increase? Uh, and do they destabilize? The situation, or are they more defensive and, and do they actually promote stability? And, and you know, I, I hate to put on my lawyer cap here, but it depends, right? <laughs> and part of the reason is because it's very, very difficult to message or to signal through cyberspace operations. Let me just say that again, because for the nuclear uh, pros keeping uh, score at home, they think about using and testing uh, different capabilities as a way to signal uh, another country of, of intention. Very difficult to signal in cyberspace. A great book on this called The Cybersecurity Dilemma by Ben Buchanan, also at Georgetown. Check it out on Amazon.com. <laughs> but uh, I, I would say, look, it, it is a, a real worry. And when you see not just the acquisition of capabilities, but the use of them in such indiscriminate fashions, it gets very worrisome. But unlike the nuclear world, where defense was not really a practical option, and hence why deterrence became the foundation. It's not because everybody loved the idea of deterrence because deterrence is cool. It's because there was no way to defend against that many thousands of nuclear-tipped ICBMs. Your only ballgame was deterrence. That's not the case in cyberspace. You have other options. Okay. So, on, so on the question about sort of um, it's like the importance of industrialization and innovation, and that your reference was was to Africa. I mean, it's um, as 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 we see in sort of overall global economic development over the last like um like um since the end of the Second World War, right? Countries that have engaged on industrialization and innovation, especially in, in East Asia, the developmental states that, that we some, they've done extremely well. But it's like, um, but it's really, really difficult itself. I mean, we've had other parts of the world that's also tried to engage in industrialization and innovation, like in Latin America, that really didn't do very well, etc. And a lot of that has to do with getting your designs right, your domestic designs. And for Africa, I think, it's like um, innovation is really, really difficult, especially in innovation if you're going to be able to be competitive with other parts of the world. And to do innovation, you really need to have the basic building blocks, right? You need to have your education apparatus, because a lot of it's about human talents. You need to build up your universities, your, say, kind of your school systems, etc. And for a lot of these, sort of, um, especially sort of very backward countries um, in Africa, etc., they haven't really invested in those areas, etc. So they m more, I think, need to focus on sort of um, less on the innovation side and much more on sort of a more like, um, like um, early stages of development, of, of, of industrialization. Um, and so it's like, um, it has to be a step-by-step -step pro pro process. It's really very difficult to be able to leapfrog itself. Um, I mean, you may have a few countries like South, South Africa or sort of, um, sort of um, other countries with, with more nat 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 resources. But one of the things that we've often found out is that um, industrialization and innovation, they have to be tailored to the socioeconomic conditions of that particular country. If you try to do it beyond that, um, it often doesn't really work very well. Yes, Jim. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim and yeah. Dr. Mi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't think you need to follow a linear path um, for development. I mean, for example, you look at Africa, um, you give the African woman handphones and they basically know how to use it and leave themselves out of poverty. Uh, I do agree that we need to prepare the society, but I think at the same time, if we follow the same model that other countries have gone through, I think we may miss an opportunity to do a lot more great work. Uh, but I think capacity building is a key to that, and I think countries have to decide. So for us in, in, in ASEAN, um, Singapore, for example, we have invested heavily in capacity building. 
and of late, of course, in cybersecurity. But the prerogative, of course, is the nations. They have to decide what sort of talent and what sort of skill set they want to build up. But certainly, I am personally in favor of, of investing in, in third world countries because I think anything that is good, I think it has to be a human right. It is something in which we should give it to all societies in a way in which they can manage it and, and sort of develop for the society. The, to the first response on the cybersecurity dilemma, I, I, I think it's an interesting question. Um, we believe in defense in Singapore. I will not talk about our offensive capability. We're not supposed to tell that. But I, I think the, the defense issue, it, it's a very complex issue because there are many moving parts. Um, uh, you know, we, we were told of a, a story which was very um, frightening of an attack of, an, of a French company in Vietnam which originated from Singapore. And when we trace it out, it came from a computer in a primary school. Uh, obviously, somebody has used that computer to put up something and then launch an attack. Uh, and so it has to be a holistic sort of defensive system. And we've taken that approach in Singapore to educate. But as mentioned by uh, Dr. Somaya, the consciousness about cybersecurity is only gaining after the last few attacks. And Singapore has seen that recently, unfortunately, where people realize that we need to invest heavily in building up our defenses. But yet, at the same time, uh, we've seen also, for example, um, you know, the weakest link is basically the, the, the worker, the person who's disgruntled about what has happened and just take the data out because you know, he, he's upset because he wasn't promoted. So to a large extent, I think the defense part has to be invested heavily to make sure that all parts uh, can, can be sort of looked to into to ensure that we can have a system. It's never 100% foolproof, but we need to deal with also with remediation measures when that happens. Dr. May, did you want uh, to add anything? Yes, I'd like to react to the question on the relationship between innovation and, um, and development. And certainly in the multilateral system of intellectual property and innovation, um, development is a very important part of that narrative. And um, if I take the, um, the experience of the WIPO, we have we operate under what's called the development agenda. So our work is based on the 45 recommendations um, um, under that development agenda. And if you also look at WTO's TRIPS agreement, the Article 7 of the TRIPS agreement provides that um, IP, IP protection and enforcement has to take place within the context, the socioeconomic context of its, mm -hmm. its country, and also repl um, reflecting the tech technology transfer needs, um, the relevant tech transfer needs. But technology transfer not in the meaning that was used in the 1970s where countries were asking for free tech transfer, but nobody is <laughs> transferring technology for free. That We are, we are beyond that, uh, that, that conversation, but that fits um, the, the interests of all relevant players. Um, and um, going, going to Africa, it is true that um, with the exception of countries like South Africa, Kenya, and Egypt, perhaps, um, there is very little um, patent protection um, um, originating um, uh, from domestic entities. But innovation is not only about high-end technology. It's also about creative industries. And if you look at um, the GDP contribution coming out of um, creative industries, it's, it's very often in countries like Nigeria quite high, almost close to 10% of the GDP. And so it's identifying the areas of strength of that country and facilitating growth. And that is how in innovation can play an uh, an important role. Yeah. And I, I, just one last comment. So capacity, on capacity building, um, so WIPO, um, um, I've talked about the revenues of WIPO, and 20% of its revenue is spent on capacity building, which is a reflection of the importance that the member states place on, in that area. OK, thank you. Um, uh, for the interest of time, I won't be able to invite more questions. But I'd like to give each speaker uh, about, about a one minute for your final remarks, uh, and maybe perhaps take a message if you have any. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yeah. I mean, going back to the theme of the conference about um, Korea's choice, right? I mean, it's like, um, I mean, in the context of what I was speaking about, in terms of this US China comp competition, I mean, one, one of the big questions is that um, 
a lot of countries now have to move, sort of um, work out where they stand, etc. And um, I think it's, um, I mean, the likelihood that um, the global order is going to go to a full-scale decoupling that uh, some people in the U.S. wants is very, very unlikely. I mean, it's like there's going to be a lot of hedging, uh, um, a lot of the U.S. Its, its allies, whether it's Korea or Japan or, or the U.K., they will try to say it's like um, it's not about national security completely. It's a trade-off between national security and economic com competitiveness. And in the newspaper to today, um, the UK decided that um, they will allow Huawei into um, um, develop some, some of the 5G systems, et cetera. And so it's, um, going forward, it's going to be a very, very important decision what the, um, countries have, which sides they will take itself. And, I, and so, um, so um, we're really into sort of um, the, the next 10, 15 years of redesigning what the long-term techn technology global order will, will be. And we're in a, it's like, this is a very interesting time. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Um, thank you. So I th um, I, I'll just um, introduce a different topic in my concluding remarks, and that is data localization, because um, um, Dr. Ibrahim talked about data protection, but uh, more and more um, debate is going on on data localization and different um, national policies towards data localization. And um, looking forward to 10, 15 years, um, I think what governments will do in that area will have a great impact um, in terms of innovation, but just very broadly. And I'll end at that, just because it was not mentioned. Well, the instinct here is to assign you some homework uh, for next year's uh, plenum when we get together and see then who's done the reading. But I, I would just conclude by saying when we talk about you know, Korea's choice, I mentioned at the end of the answer to the question that on, on 5G, it's been fascinating for me to continue to see how Korea thinks about its, its choices and the Korean telco companies think about its choices as well as government policy. And it, it often gets lost in the mix of the US, China, Britain, you know, these, these conversations and uh, Korea remains uh, a very important uh, player in that space. And then, you know, when we talk about the indiscriminate cyber attack uh, from the prepared remarks, we just note again, you know, I had the honor of spending a day with the Korean uh, cyber forces last year when I was was here, and it's a very professional force. And uh, those you know, relationships are uh, with the U.S. military and other militaries. We think about mill-to-mill -mill relationships. There's some choices for all of us about how we want to have those relationships go forward in terms of cyber defense and mutual defense as well. So uh, big, uh, big topics that we can keep discussing, and look forward to seeing everybody next year. Okay. Right. Um, Thank you very much again for inviting us here. Um, I think one of the big concerns of the coming years is, of course, to me, is the digital divide that's taking place, not in societies, but within countries. Korea, for example, between North and South is clearly evident. Uh, the question that going forward as a global community, should we allow that to happen in every part of the world? The question we'll ask about Africa. Do we want to leave Africa behind so that we can move forward and not allow them the opportunities of what the digital economy can offer. I think those are big questions that need to be asked. And certainly, I think Singapore, being a small country, is prepared to play a role at the international arena to voice our concern and whatever that we can share in terms of our expertise to build up not just us, but the rest of the global community. Okay. Thank you. Um, although we'd like to uh, continue this wonderful conversation, um, I will have to bring this uh, session to an end. Um, so please join me uh, thanking all those four wonderful panelists who share their insight and knowledge here with us today. Okay, thank you. Uh